Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Good. So I think um, it's probably best to just delve into the talk. Um, I will um, share my screen. Uh, I just want to show you her book, everyone. This is her beautiful book. But just tell them who you are a little bit, or is I that in the talk? Um, okay. I will just start sharing. Great. Uh, All right, you should all be able to see my slides now. Yes. So I'm an, an adjunct clinical professor of pathology at the Stanford University School of Medicine. I stepped away from academic medicine a few years ago and became really excited about lifestyle medicine, uh, decided to certify in it. And this is now my primary area of focus, even though I'm still happily affiliated with Stanford and I'm still mentoring and teaching there. So, um, I have 30 minutes to cover the science of health and happiness, and that is a little bit ambitious, but I will take you on a journey so um, that we can hit some of the highlights, okay? So, do you want to live as long as possible while feeling as well as possible? I assume you do, but then you need to know how you can support your health and happiness, right? You need to know what's for real. And we have a fountain of information and that's fun. Uh, there's so much information at our fingertips, but it can also be really overwhelming and confusing. Our sources of information are often contradicting each other and there is so much to wade through. Now, fortunately, science is a great tool to separate fact from fiction. And in my new book, which is shown here, I look at the scientific basis of what we think we know about healthy living. And in this talk, I will show you some of the things we know today based on that science. So health and happiness, of course, are influenced by many things. They are the things that we choose, but also our circumstances and outside influences. And we often don't even realize that we are influenced or manipulated. The question really is, are you going to be taken on a roller coaster ride? or are you going to be in the driver's seat as much as possible? Let me show you why I'm so passionate about that. We'll start by having a look at the state of health and happiness in the US today. Are we the United States of health? Well, here's some information sourced from the CDC about chronic disease in the US and it's presented by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. 60% of adults have a chronic disease and 40% have more than one. Almost 40% of us will be diagnosed with cancer during our lifetimes. And we can never prevent all cancers, unfortunately, but we do know that at least a third of the cancers in the US could be prevented. And that amounts to 340,000 preventable cancers each year. Now, also, over one in three, 38% of people live with prediabetes, and the vast majority of them don't even know that they're on track to develop actual diabetes. And we see more and more diabetes in kids. And now over 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese. Now, these stats are alarming, but they have been rising over decades. And what are the major causes of death then? Well, I chose to show you the information from 2019 uh, from the CDC. The order hasn't changed in 2020, except of course for the appearance of COVID-19, right? So in 2020, that's the latest data set. It was in place three in this table and it accounted for 10.4% of all deaths. So after that, everything is lower than 10%. But what you see on this list, really the take home message is that the vast majority of causes of death are either cardiac disease or malignancies and that the list is filled with chronic conditions. Now on the last slide, you saw the top 10 leading causes of death in the US. Now let's look at the leading risk factors for death. The top five shown here are dietary risks, smoking, high blood pressure, overweight, 
and high blood glucose. And at the bottom, you see the 17 risk factors for disability, and they're very similar. All of these fuel the epidemic of chronic diseases and lead to premature deaths. Now, this is the slide that shows you why you should care. In the past century, the primary focus really was on life expectancy, on lifespan. And major strides have been made, especially by reducing early childhood deaths, right? And that was achieved with better hygiene, clean drinking water, and the advent of antibiotics. But this upward trend has not been sustained in recent years. In 2018, our life expectancy was just under 79 years with 76 for men and 81 for women. But if current trends continue, then babies born today will live shorter, sicker lives than their parents. So we don't only need to look at lifespan, even though that's important, we also need to look at health span. I don't know about you, but my goal is to add years to life and life to years. So what I want to do is square this curve, right? So basically I want to be healthy, 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 dead, because we all have to die. But what we see today, and that's, that's indicated by the green arrow, is that people become sick sooner, decades sooner, and that there is a slow gradual decline with a lot of disability ending in a premature death. Now you might say, well, you know, that's some people, but it's not just some people. And you might also say, well, aren't most of us living a pretty healthy life? So let me show you. According to the CDC, only about one in 10 adults meet the guidelines for either fruit or vegetable intake. But in a national survey, about three out of four people say that they eat a healthy diet. So there is quite a discrepancy between perception and reality. There is a reason for the acronym of the standard American diet. It's kind of sad. Which begs the question, of course, what are we eating? Well, the total amount of meat consumed in the US has increased by 40% since 1961. And you can see in this graph um, that we are right at the top there. There's a tiny dot above us, that's Hong Kong. But basically the United States are the top consumers of meat in the world. And that has dramatic effects on us as well as on our environment. But the answer as to what we are eating is not as simple as just meat. Actually, it's processed food. So our diet is problematic, and as a nation, we are becoming obese. The American Medical Association officially recognized obesity as a disease in 2014. But obesity is also a risk factor for chronic diseases, also for disability and for premature death. So for example, obesity tripled the likelihood of being hospitalized okay. for COVID. And it also was the number one risk factor for dying from COVID in people under 65. So what do you see in this figure? In this figure, you see our map. And then in a few years, seeing that map become much darker, right? And what we're looking at here is the combination of obesity and diabetes. Mm. And you know, you, you can appreciate, even if you're not a scientist, that this is a very worry, worrisome, very quick development. And obesity is rising. More than 42% of adults are now obese, and there is no significant difference between men and women or by age group. So we need to stop shaming. We need to stop blaming. And we actually need to acknowledge the root causes of this widespread issue. All right, so what about physical activity then? The guidelines for Americans are that you need to have uh, 150 minutes of moderate exercise um, per week. Now that sounds a lot, especially for working physicians, but 150 minutes per week is actually 30 minutes five times a day, uh, five times a week for five days a week. 30 minutes, five days a week. And, um, you can also do vigorous exercise, then you don't even need the 150 minutes. 
Now, nationally, about one in four adults meet the physical activity goals, but the range for individual states is wide, from less than one in 12, and those are the light green ones, to a high of about one in three, and those are the dark blue ones. So you can see that even in New York, we could do a little better. There also was an interesting study by the Mayo Clinic that looked at whether we actually live a healthy lifestyle. They included physical activity guidelines, but they also looked at a diet score in the top 40% of the healthy eating index. So that's pretty generous. Also, they looked at a normal body fat percentage and not smoking. So think about for yourself, what percentage of people based on those four criteria do you think lived a healthy lifestyle? The answer is less than 3%. And then are we happy? Almost one in three people in the US will have a serious mental health issue during their lifetime. And more than one in three Americans feel very lonely. Now this lack of true connection affects all ages and was of course exacerbated by the pandemic. But what I found interesting was that it was especially true for young adults. Also, when you ask people about the biggest stressors in their life, that work and money come up first at 64% each. And that's closely followed by health concerns at 63%. So how did we get there? Let me give you a crash course. First of all, industrialization caused global changes. We all know that. We increasingly moved away from rural uh, to urban settings and then technical progress allowed us to become less active and more sedentary. And food production became more efficient because of machines and pesticides and genetic modification. So foods became cheaper to produce and the food industry was able to scale up and created more shelf stable items. So you had this globalization of food and what we consumed changed from natural staple, staple foods like tubers and grains to highly processed foods. And these typically have a lot of calories and little nutritional value. And they are also far removed from whole food that is close to nature. So we arrived at what I call the new abnormal, where actually we're eating edible food-like substances like snack soda, ready meals, and many other products that are made from substances derived from food but with little, if any, intact food in them. And those are, are loaded with salt, sugar, and fat. You may not know this, but companies actually have craveability experts or experience experts that make sure that there is that perfect balance of salt and sugar and fat and that perfect crunch in your potato chip. So no wonder that you can't um, resist that, right? And I think we're all familiar with the supersizing from the 1950s to now. So meat consumption has also skyrocketed and a lot of that meat is processed and that includes hot dogs, sausage, ham, bacon, lunch meat and jerky. So true or false? Processed meats are carcinogenic to humans. It's true. That was established by the World Health Organization. I'm not making it up. They are group one carcinogen, primarily for colon cancer and stomach cancer. Now that sounds alarming, I know, but as a scientist, I do need to add nuance here. And that's something you often don't see in the media. So the level of risk associated with smoking, for example, is considerably higher like for lung cancer, it's about 20 fold or a 2000% increase, right? With processed meat, there is an 18% increased risk for colon cancer per 50 grams, that's about two ounces of processed meat intake per day. Nevertheless, I think we do need to take note of this uh, because that uh, correlation is real. Now, shifting a little bit from why we are so under the spell of these processed foods and other things, we are under the influence. 
I like to say that knowledge based on science is like Harry Potter's defense against the dark arts because our choices are a mix of rational thought and subconscious influences, and they include superstition, myth, and folklore. There are also pseudoscientific notions about health. I think we've probably all heard about this eight by eight rule where you're supposed to drink eight, eight ounce glasses of water each day. Now that's a pretty innocent example, but the specificity and the use of numbers here really suggests that there is rigorous scientific research and that that produced a definitive finding, right? Well, when I researched that, when I, when I actually looked for such studies, there is nothing like that here. Um, and actually there is also a paper that confirms that. Of course, it's a good idea to be well hydrated, but you can actually just you know, look at your urine, assess whether you're thirsty. If your urine is clear, if you're not thirsty, you're probably okay. You don't need an app for that. And then there are biases. Now biases complicate the successful correction of our false beliefs and they affect all of us in many different ways. Of course, we may be more aware of it uh, than others, but um, they still affect us. Being aware of it is only the first step. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, there's, for example, the negatively biased credulity, which means that information that points to danger and harm is more believable to us, but also more likely to be remembered and shared. And then there is the illusory truth effect, which you see a lot in the media and also in politics. And that means that repeated statements receive higher truth ratings. All such influences can be used to manipulate us, to direct our decisions. And that includes decisions about health. And that happens especially when we're in a vulnerable state, when we're tired, when we're hungry, and when we're not feeling well, when we're ill. All right, so now you know the state of our health and happiness and how we got there. And now we'll look at some of the science of health and happiness. Can the science of health and happiness help us? Well, science gives us tools and helps us understand our world, whether we're scientists or not. It helps us make sound decisions and it helps us connect the dots and it can reduce the power of baseless claims. We all shape our life by what we think and that brings us to mind and body. Now health approaches that modify the mind and thereby influence the body have been pretty well studied. And some of this wisdom has come down to us through the ages, of course, but now there are also studies to back that up. It's scientifically supported by numerous studies, including randomized controlled trials, that these approaches can be medically useful, cost-effective, and that they can have minimal side effects. And they have been especially effective in the conditions listed here, ranging from insomnia to positive effects on surgical outcomes. Now, most of the research has focused on how the mind influences the body, but studies that look at the effects of the body on the mind are emerging as well. And I think that's very exciting and that's also a very active area of research. So take the microbiome in our gut. They really are our essential workers. They have so many different tasks and the microbes in the gut actually communicate with other organs, including the brain. In fact, communications between the brain and the gut go back and forth in rapid succession. And it's the microbes that are doing much of the calling. And they do that through neural networks, through chemicals and immune system components. Now in my book, I describe the story of the Canadian town of Walkerton which was studied for an amazing eight years after farm runoff contaminated their drinking water and caused acute dysentery in about half the population. And several people also died at the time. It's a prime example of how a disturbed microbiome resulted in long-term health and uh, mental health effects. So that's a really, um, really profound finding at the time. So our microbiome is connected to our health and happiness. And how do we keep it happy? A high fiber diet is key. Um, and also if we stress less, your microbiome will stress less. 
Now, by making your gut happy, you can improve your health and happiness, but you might still say, so what? You know, I was born with my set of genes and that's that. There's heart disease in my family, so I'm going to have heart disease, right? But as a geneticist, because I'm trained in molecular genetics, clinical pathology and lifestyle medicine, I can tell you that genes alone do not determine destiny. Genetic information, in fact, determines less than a quarter of the variation in human lifespan. And until the age of about 70 or 80, it's actually lifestyle that surpasses your genes for health and longevity. And only about a third of your sense of happiness is based on genetics. So you can make a positive difference in your well being in any phase of life. Let's look at the positive impact of lifestyle changes. And I'm going to use heart disease as one example because we're going to be talking about diabetes a little bit later in the next presentation. So, lifestyle medicine uses evidence based lifestyle changes to prevent, treat, and when used intensively enough, often reverse chronic diseases. And it has six pillars, and they're symbolized here in this honeycomb figure. The first one is a whole food plant predominant eating pattern. That's really important. Also optimizing individual physical activity plans. The third one is improving restorative sleep, especially people on the East Coast are chronically sleep deprived. The fourth is managing stress with healthy coping strategies. The fifth is avoidance of risky substances like drugs, alcohol. And the sixth is forming and maintaining positive social connections. That is actually profoundly important for our happiness. So lifestyle medicine is an integral part of regular medicine, but in lifestyle medicine, your prescription may just be an exercise prescription. All right, so I'll give you some examples of a large body of evidence of preventing, treating, and even reversing heart disease. Okay, so we'll look at some studies really quickly. First up, Swedish men. The results of this study that looked at low risk factors showed that a combined low risk behavior prevented four out of five myocardial infarctions. So what they looked at was a healthy diet, no to moderate alcohol consumption, not smoking, being physically active, and a normal waist circumference. So each additional factor reduced the risk of a myocardial infarction. And again, a combined low-risk behavior prevented almost four out of five heart attacks. And there is no drug in the world with such proven efficacy. The next up, treating heart disease. Here, I show you two studies. The first one had the goal of reducing LDL. And this was the first study to show that diet can be as effective as statins in lowering cholesterol. The, results was a, the result was a change in cholesterol levels down about 30% in four weeks. And it was the same cholesterol control without side effects of a low dose statin. So if you look at the graph there, there was no statistically significant difference between the group that took statins and the group that just took uh, cholesterol lowering food, excuse me, foods like high fiber, almonds, soy, and plant sterols. The second group, uh, the second study on the right shows you the goal of event-free survival after one year in people with heart disease. So we have two groups again. One was given only exercise training the other one was giving a percutaneous coronary intervention with stenting. And what they saw was that event-free overall survival was better in the exercise group. They also had better exercise capacity and it was all done at a much lower cost with fewer hospitalizations in that year. And then finally, reversing heart disease. There are two big pioneers in this area. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn treated cohorts of patients who had run out of treatment options. He was one of the first physicians who showed that lifestyle changes can not only stop, but actually reverse heart disease. And these were the worst possible patients, right? This was really, a, this was a group that had no other hope. 
And in this uh, figure here, you can see um, the reversal of the heart disease in one of his patients. Now, these patients were very dedicated and they were followed for a really long time. And the recurrent event rate was extremely low. And these patients received plant-based nutrition in addition to the usual cardiac care. So if they were on heart uh, medication, then they were uh, given that um, continuously as needed. Now, the second physician is Dr. Dean Ornish, also a pioneer who is very famous for the lifestyle heart trial. And he had two groups. One of them received standard cardiac care. The other group received the regimen that is shown on the slide with no cholesterol lowering medications at all. And in that group, there was more regression of coronary artery disease after five years versus one year, whereas the other group increased stenosis despite their medications. So these are groundbreaking studies and physicians didn't believe it was possible back then, but now we have a solid body of science that shows that it is. And it's not just for heart disease, it's also true for diabetes and for other chronic diseases. All of this, of course, being a very active area of research, because I think this is where the hope is for the future. All right, now on this slide, you can see the risk factors for cardiac disease. And I think we're all familiar with those. Um, but what I want to highlight here is that Chronic diseases are not separate entities. They often arise in one person, but their risk factors impact one another as they are happening inside one body. What they have in common, all the chronic diseases, all the risk factors, is that they lead to chronic inflammation. So if all things are connected, shouldn't we have more comprehensive approaches to chronic diseases? Currently, they're often dealt with one by one as if they were independent, but instead they typically result from an overall poor state of health. We can treat these diseases by drugs, that's disease management, not cure, but in many cases, you can actually cut out the middleman. In healthcare, we so often focus on mopping the floor that we forget to turn off the faucet. And then finally, are health and happiness connected? And the answer there is yes. It seems intuitively right that happiness contributes to health and longevity, but today there's also evidence to back that up. One differentiating factor may well be behavior. People who are happier tend to have better health habits and vice versa. And happiness has been associated with a reduced risk of chronic inflammation and a lower risk of chronic diseases. But one word of caution, happiness is no guarantee for good health because there are no guarantees in life, right? Only likelihoods. And that's a mistake that is also often made, uh, also in the media. Everybody knows somebody who was drinking and smoking and still lived to be 100. But that's just an association. It's not a correlation. When we're looking at population-wide studies that are well-powered, statistically significant, we do see that these correlations actually exist. All right, so in that sense, I like the framework of positive health. You take the six pillars of lifestyle medicine and you combine that with the concept of positive psychology. So as a reminder, positive psychology is not so much fixing what's wrong, it's rather applicable to all of us in that we can build what's strong. And why is that important? Well. Motivation, when you want to make a positive change to your health, is important because motiv motivation is needed to get you going, but you need positive emotions to keep you going. And that's why the New Year's resolution so often fail. With positive emotions, you can nourish healthy habits and vice versa. And in that way, you can increase your physical, mental, social, and emotional well being. We'll wrap up with your health, happiness, and thriving. Ask yourself, which aspects of your health and well-being can use a boost? Don't forget that small shifts over time can make a big difference in health outcomes and in your own quality of life.
And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, again, this is my book in case you're interested. It is now, I'm very excited to say, available as a Kindle on Amazon. So that's really affordable. Uh, you can find out more about me on my website, lifestyleforhealthandwellness.com. And there's also a discount code should you be interested in either the hard copy or the recently published paperback. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah. You're muted, Alice. Thank you. Um, this was really inspiring and breathtaking visually as well as content wise. So I really have to thank you for an outstanding overview. And, you know, obviously the book is also available as an ebook in our library. So we have that. And that is in the chat by Wendy Herman. And we have one copy in print. We actually have two, I guess, since I have a copy in my hand. I don't think it's the library copy. And um, you could definitely get that. In terms of the PowerPoint, um, this always goes out if we get permission from the speaker um, after the session. So I will discuss that with Iris post-session. Um, so that is the deal. And I'm going to turn things over. Let me... Um, bring up the other PowerPoint and I know you goes here. So this is wonderful. I already introduced you when you were not here. So yeah, just sorry, I had issues know. getting the link. That's okay. I just want to tell you, I raved about you and all your accolades of who you are and everything. So um, we have a part two of this and then we'll have a discussion. And part two of this, I just want to say, it's really important as I get my slide deck up here to think how do we dis distinguish between the emerging field of lifestyle medicine and preventive medicine as a discussion point when we finish this brief article presentation. Because the American College of Preventive Medicine has been around since the 50s. And now we're focusing on lifestyle medicine, which Hugo is heading up as a track in the lifestyle medicine curriculum. So I'm going to turn things over to Hugo and um, let him talk briefly about this article, and then we'll have some discussion. How does that sound to everyone? And if you have any questions or comments on Iris's presentation, please, please put that in the chat. Uh, so, so thank you for the intro. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the question that she sort of posed as food for thought, uh, I like to think of the fact that while lifestyle medicine does have a very strong, you know, primordial and primary preventive model baked into it because it's uh, promoting healthy habits, it also uh, has a very strong medicine intervention aspect. Uh, and this is, for example, one of them, right? Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the, the direct trial, the diabetes remission clinical trial uh, that was done in 2018. Uh, by Lean and others. Uh, this uh, study uh, that uh, when Dr. Renard will go to the next slide was done in Scotland and Tinsdale across 49 uh, primary care practices. Uh, next slide. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, it was an open label cluster randomized trial, meaning each uh, clinic was assigned to either the intervention or the control group. Uh, and the clinics themselves and the staff there knew who, what they were assigned to, but the statistician and the person who did the, uh, the numbers was, uh, con the data was concealed on, on what group they were assigned to. The inclusion criteria for this were 20 to 65 year olds who were diagnosed within six years, who were overweight or obese and not on insulin. Uh, the exclusion criteria were those who were on insulin, had a very high A1C, and also had severe CHF, substance abuse and cancer and couldn't afford being taken off of medicine. And that ties into the methods because the intervention group uh, for the methods section, they were actually put on this thing called the counterweight plus uh, protocol, which counterweight uh, plus is a sort of meal replacement slash delivery service that was available in the UK. Uh, Dr. Barney, can you do the next slide? Thank you. The, 
it's available in the UK and it uh, basically gave them 825 to 853 calories per day, right? They were given this program and they were given these meal replacements for a total of three to five months, right? The patients were able to ask for extra time if they wanted to lose extra weight. After the, uh, after the initial weight loss phase, they were then put on a two to, week, uh, two to eight week food um, reintroduction to gradually build up to a normal diet again. And then they were given monthly or biweekly uh, maintenance support uh, through these visits with dietitians and, and other people uh, for a total of a year. And then the primary outcomes were measured after a year. The primary outcomes being the 15 kilogram weight loss, uh, an A1C less than 6.5 for more than two months, meaning that they were in diabetic remission. The control group just got best practice. Uh, another thing that I should mention is that the uh, intervention group were taken off all oral anti-diabetic meds and oral uh, hypertensive meds because it's been shown that a low calorie diet has a very strong effect on, hyper, uh, on blood pressure and they didn't want anyone to become hypotensive by continuing to take their meds. Uh, next slide. The results uh, were, were actually very great. There, there was 149 uh, per group, right, versus intervention and control group in the number of patients who participated, right? They did an intention to treat analysis. So they still kept track of people who dropped out for whatever reason, about a quarter, uh, so, sorry, about 23, um, were lost to follow up. Uh, and about a quarter over the period of time that we're doing the intervention group uh, fell off for some reason or another. The outcomes themselves uh, for the weight loss showed that there was about 24% who were able to achieve a greater than 15 kilogram weight loss and maintain it. And the more important part here that we're talking about today is that diabetes remission was actually able to happen in 48% of the intervention group. And just the weight stratified, they, they, they categorized it based on how much weight was lost. And you can see here on the bottom of the, the chart that those who had more than 15 kilogram weight loss had an 86% remission, uh, which is extremely high. And uh, is, one of the, is, is one of the first studies to show that just weight loss alone without bariatric surgery can act as a uh, means to put diabetes into remission. Next slide. All right. And so these are some of the secondary outcomes that they also had. Uh, I wanted to point out uh, mainly the fact that uh, a good chunk of the patients actually were able to stay off of their blood pressure medicines as well as a sort of side benefit of this intervention. Um, and so a good chunk of them that started with one or two medicines ended up on zero by the end of it and didn't, didn't have to go back on any hypertensive meds. Another thing that they also measured through the quality of life uh, validated assessment tool was that their quality of life improved um, and that they were a lot happier with themselves at the end of it. Uh, next slide. So, uh, in, and these are just uh, next points, so you can just keep hitting forward. So the, the, the things that I wanted to point out with this trial is because it was in Scotland and Tinsdale in the UK, it is extremely white. So it was more than 98% white. Uh, so obviously in terms of like a diverse patient population, including Southeast Asians, uh, Asians, you know, um, Hispanic, Latino, Blacks, and things like that, where you are, cannot be, you know, generalized. Uh, uh, next. Right, the trial was done in an outpatient setting, which I think is important because it shows that it is doable, right? Uh, and that it is feasible because in general, most outpatient clinics don't have the most resources. And the fact that they were able to run something like this for their patients shows that it is somewhat doable. Uh, next, yeah. Uh, one of the things that happened is, so I didn't mention it specifically, but some people in the control group did enter remission but the people in the control group who went into remission had to have lost some weight. No one who didn't lose any weight went into diabetes remission. Uh, and so that's something to point out. Overall, the average A1C was about 7.6 and insulin was an exclusion criteria. So we can't really extrapolate this um, intervention too much to poorly controlled or insulin dependent diabetes meds. The counterweight plus protocol is a UK specific thing, right, for the meal replacement. 
medical meal deliveries is something that is happening now in the US. Some insurance companies are starting to go through it. Uh, some of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine corporate partners actually do medical meal deliveries. And so that is something that is starting to build. And hopefully as it continues to build, something like this can easily start to happen over here. And so we can start seeing similar results. Next. And uh, one of the last things was that a, about a quarter of the group uh, actually ended up dropping out of the intervention. Uh, and they cited, I, it was in the appendix, but they cited like social reasons. There was a variety of reasons why they couldn't do it. Um, but it wasn't that it, a lot of them didn't complain about doing the thing themselves. It's just that they weren't able to handle it because they had other things to attend to. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So I'll be going over the bibliometrics of this particular um, article. And as you can see on the screen, there's been uh, a very high level of citations, captures, mentions, and social media mentions for this particular article. It's been very well circulated and very well spoken about and saved and downloaded. Um, what I wanted to actually highlight, aside from the numbers here, and I won't go into all the 825 citations that have cited back this article, but what was interesting, um, diving into kind of the social media posts and discussions around this article. Um, one, a, a common, um, discussion thread that came up is the concept of uh, diabetes going into remission as opposed to curing diabetes. I think um, Hugo had used the term remission um, uh, throughout his presentation. And I think that a lot of, uh, at least social media users kind of highlighted the fact that it's in remission, it doesn't actually cure diabetes. With that being said, there's also a discussion of sustainability. So during this program, it was great. But after you are off this counterweight program and, mon and close physician monitoring, how sustainable is it for the individual is also an interesting discussion that was um, had. Another, um, uh, discussion point was the issues of, of the one size fits all model. Um, due to the lack of diversity in this particular study, there, there were some users who were concerned about issuing a, a model like this where it's a one size fits all. Um, and then another thing um, that just kind of caught my eye when I was looking through the article is the declaration of interest. So the authors, uh, I, I forget if it was one or um, multiple authors were employed by counterweight um, during the study, although they had acknowledged that in, um, in print in the manuscript. And they had also acknowledged that um, none of the entities had any hand in the study design and whatnot. Um, it was just a, an interesting thing to know um, when looking at the declaration of interests. muted, Alice. I'm not living in my own home with lots of noise, so I'm constantly muting myself. I apologize. I'm usually by myself, but I have a dog and a baby with me right now. Okay, so let's talk about some discussion questions. I know Hugo and Iris, as well as um, Dr. Robert Gluck are here, Hugo Ortego, Dr. Ortego, and Dr. Shriver and Dr. Gluck, and we brought up some questions, but before we go to our questions, does anybody, I wanna give the audience a chance to speak. Um, we have a nice 20 minutes for discussion here. So we have questions, but would anybody from the audience like to speak? And I'll try and identify by either raising hand or just unmuting yourself. Um, Stacy, I know you made a comment in the chat. Yeah, do you want me to read my question? Sure, go ahead, please. Um, thank you, first of all, to all of you. This has been a real fascinating discussion and I'm learning so much. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on how patients with chronic inflammation, I know um, that was mentioned earlier, but when patients have chronic inflammation that causes sort of a cascade of conditions, can find a clinician who can help them. Um, because often this leads to patients having to navigate with many, many doctors who manage and treat certain parts and not the whole body. So I'm a, I'm the senior librarian for the Eastern Region Hospitals, and I wanted to know, as a medical librarian who finds information, how can we find information for patients about treating that whole health for themselves? Does Thank anyone you. want to address of our speakers, the Lifestyle Medicine if, Association or organization, if they're involved in? help listing doctors who are certified? 
Iris? Yes, there is actually a, on the website of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, there is an outward facing directory of lifestyle medicine physicians and other practitioners. Um, so nutritionists and dietitians and, and others um, who are also trained at their level and certified in lifestyle medicine. So um, th there are many in your region, um, undoubtedly as well. Great. Well, that is a good resource. Hugo or Bob, do you, anybody want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I, I was actually going to post the link just so that people can see. Um, but yeah, you can search up for a provider. Uh, and then it, there's even some people here in Northwell who are core certified right. as well. Yeah, I met a woman the other day, um, actually, who I did, knew well, but I didn't know she was certified in lifestyle medicine. I actually referred her to you, Go, as a resource. And she works within Northwell in an outpatient clinic in Queens, and she's certified in lifestyle medicine. So, so secret <clears throat> pockets. Can I just Talk. jump in? So yeah, yes. we have, so Northwell um, has some uh, sort of uh, involvement with this as well. We have, a, there's a wellness center in Roslyn, Old Northern Boulevard. There's one up in, up, uh, in Mount Kisco or near Chappaqua. It's part of Northwell. So locally here, Penny Stern uh, is very much involved with this. Uh, Northwell actually just joined up as a founding member of the National Council. So they're actually, the American College has reached out to Northwell and is going to actually, I think, gratis um, reach out to train, you know, as many people as want to get trained. I think Hugo has some more information on that. So, uh, so we do have people here uh, through Northwell. Uh, Penny Stern, as I mentioned, is one contact person, and um, right. we have the two centers, right. and there will be more coming. I just want to mention Penny um, was not able to be on today. She wanted to be, but she was not, so she's definitely a resource, as well as our Center for Wellness in Roslyn. Um, they do a tremendous amount with lifestyle medicine support, you know, supporting lifestyle medicine. Any other questions from the audience before we go to our proposed questions for our speakers? I'm looking at the chat and I don't see a specific question. I love the connection of lifestyle medicine to happiness. Um, to me, that is something that's a big motivator and an influence happiness of taking on lifestyle medicine. Most people I think should know that I am a registered dietitian in my first life and always practiced um, healthy eating and physical activity as part of my lifestyle. So this is another reason this topic is so dear to my heart as a registered dietitian, I can't say how much I've advocated for healthy lifestyle. And I know we have some RDs on the call today and I didn't know if any of you have any questions or the interns that are on the call, the registered dietitian, the students studying to be registered dietitians. But if you do just put in the chat, I'm monitoring the chat as well as you can raise your hand. Um, so who would like to take the first question? Where do you draw boundaries on what we define as healthy and unsupervised lifestyle modification? Anybody want to take the first question? I mean, I could jump, jump in and frame, frame the question. Um, it was a question I suggested. And what I had in mind was, uh, so, you know, cannabis now is widely used um, for medically. Uh, of course, for the longest time, it wasn't. Uh, it's used in a supervised fashion now, and it's to great effect. Um, of course, people still using it recreationally. Uh, as of late, uh, some of the psychedelic medications are increasingly used for depression and other mental health conditions. Actually at Mount Sinai right here in New York, it's being used as a center uh, within the psychiatric department at Stanford as well. Um, so the question is, you know, where do we draw the uh, boundaries in terms of, uh, you know, as the question says, between healthy and unsupervised lifestyle medication where, you know, well, uh, and I'll throw that out to Iris since you're out at Stanford. I don't know if you have any familiarity with, with that program, but again, I just give those two examples to give it some context. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, 
I am not familiar with that program per se. For anybody who wants to learn a little more about the history of, of those kinds of psychedelics, Fantastic Fungi is a great movie to just familiarize yourself, you know, as, as entertainment, but still also has a lot of information. I think in general, I'd like to speak in general and not for palliative care or very specific well-controlled circumstances where uh, psychedelics or cannabis are used as a medication. In general, the lifestyle medicine pillars that I mentioned, you know, whole foods, plant-based uh, diet, focusing on sleep, stress reduction, good connections with others um, and exercise um, includes not using harmful substances. So there are so many downsides to recre recreational cannabis use. For example, you know, think about smoke inhalation. Um, there are still, uh, I think, 70 or, or I, I don't remember whether it was 70 or 700, honestly, but there were so many carcinogenic elements in that, that there is no general recommendation. Uh, in fact, quite the contrary of using any such substances. Um, so focusing on, on the six pillars of lifestyle medicine in general for the vast majority of people is the best way to good health. Thank you. That's such a great perspective. Um, having pillars to me is very important and pe not everybody resonates to every pillar, but you do have flexibility here and that's what's important. And people prioritize certain pillars over others, depending on stage of life and what they're doing. So I think that's a wonderful piece of the lifestyle medicine approach. It's, it's adaptable and not prescriptive, you know, that you have to. Talking about prescriptive, the next question is a little bit about prescriptive. Like, you know, I was an RD for many, many years. So I, this question came to me. I didn't write this question. Hugo, I think you wrote it or did somebody else? Uh, this was Dr. Gluck's question. Do you have any thoughts on this, Hugo? Uh, so yeah, I was gonna say, um, you know, in terms of the, the diets, right, that like push for weight loss, like keto and stuff. I mean, we have learned certain things such as the fact that even uh, a small amount of, of fat intake, animal fat intake can lead to uh, like sclerosing that can be seen within a couple of hours of the vasculature. And it also leads to like increased insulin resistance. And so there's a, a concept known as like, like double diabetes where people with keto think that they're treating their medical condition because they're not getting um, carbs in their diet. But once they're completely off, their insulin resistance has, has raised, raised so high that once they go back to a normal diet, everything falls out of control. But in, in addition, um, I, I, I think sticking to one diet is not really the point. It's mostly pushing them towards the healthier parts of the diet with the goal of eventually moving them down the line. I, I think of it more of a, as a spectrum of like the sad diet being the worst and like a whole food plant-based diet being the best. And the further along we push them, the better, but not to take away anything that will make them miserable. And I, less, I like the idea of this spectrum um, of, you know, people are on spectrums today for many reasons and many ways of identification. And I think, you know, you say to somebody, are you a vegan? Are you a vegetarian? You know, there's spectrums here. And I think that the idea of the plant-based, you know, the idea with plant-based diets is great, but sometimes you might be adding fish to your diet or whatever. So I always felt as an RD the need to have some flexibility in my message unless it was a health concern like an allergy or, you know, something that you had to avoid. But um, I love the concept of my plate because what my plate also addresses is portion control. And some of the fad diets out there don't address portion control. And my plate does talk about a readjustment of portions. And um, I think that's an important piece um, of healthy eating. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. Can I ask a follow-up question? Go ahead. 
So just taking off on what you just said and, and, and the research that Hugo presented. So, I mean, those results from the direct study were incredible. Um, you know, I, I saw you commented on that in the chat, Alice. I mean, the results were amazing, amazing. And, you know, there have been other studies. There, there was a report from Canada a few years ago in, in the Annals of Internal Medicine. They talked about tremendous results in preventing diabetes, same thing. Um, the fact is, as Hugo mentioned, I mean, this is a very extreme thing. There was a dropout rate. I mean, he mentioned some of the factors. The question about sustainability. Um, you know, it's, this involves total diet replacement. So this is not my plate. This is total diet replacement. It's very extreme. And then the question I would raise, just Iris mentioned, you know, the connection between health and happiness. Uh, you know, how happy are these people on this extreme diet? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's that question. Uh, I, I raised that. And then just sort of as an associated question, just as one of the few surgeons here, I think, uh, you know, I have to tip my hat to the surgeons. Uh, you know, is it a failure? Uh, you know, Hugo mentioned very in passing that these results were, you know, as great as any other than surgical intervention. So gastric sleeve has come a long way. Is it a failure uh, for lifestyle medicine counseling uh, to mention, you know, to introduce that as an option, the gastric sleeve, let's say? Uh, and how do we balance, you know, the uh, sort of counseling and education to our patients within that context. And I would address right. that to anybody, but especially I think uh, Alice. Well, I mean, sorry, we are at, uh, we're, Iris. I'm sorry, Iris could take that on. We're at one o'clock and I just wanna be courteous and we can stay on a few more minutes for questions. I apologize, I, as usual, packed too much in, but I did wanna show, um, at least one article and then the wonderful book that we have from Iris and thank everybody. And then we could stay on for some questions, whoever can. The next journal club I just wanna mention is really exciting. It's being done actually by Maria Blanco, but it's an actual tremendous author line on an academic medicine article dealing with um, educational scholarship, which is something we're constantly struggling with getting published in educational reams. And they've come up with these guidelines that are just wonderful that were published. So think about joining for that. And um, I want to thank our speakers. So I'll stay on for some questions. I'm going to stop sharing so we can all see each other. And um, what about surgical interventions, I guess, is where Bob was going a little bit. Um, I have my thoughts on surgical interventions. And I don't know if there's anybody on here who is dealing with, um, as a dietitian with um, gastric surgery interventions. But Iris, do you want to address any of that? Yes, I would love to address that question. Um, it's in lifestyle medicine, it's not an all or nothing. And I think that's important for all of us. Uh, in lifestyle medicine, the physician and the team actually work with the patient to see where they're at and then help them move forward towards better health. So it's not about all of a sudden going to a plant-based diet. It is exactly as Hugo said, it is a spectrum. And what we saw in the direct study, which really was a critically important study, was that if people lost 15 kilograms, so it wasn't based on individual, they just said 15 kilograms, 86% of patients went into remission. And remission here, as long as they keep the weight off, does seem to be a cure. And I think that is also really important. It's not a temporary thing. What is a temporary thing is the diet they were put on. The whole idea was to bring the weight down fairly rapidly and then to reintroduce a whole foods plant-based way of eating so that they could keep the weight off and not have a specific diet to follow, to not have draconian measures that they would be miserable for the rest of their life, but actually that they could enjoy their life with a diet that was sustainable, delicious and nutritious. And, and that is a very important message um, that is not covered in the paper itself, but that is actually, um, you know, th that Roy Taylor and others um, in the UK have worked very hard toward um, distributing. It's so important that idea that you could stay on something as a lifestyle after you've done this intervention, because I always said to people as an RD, 
anybody can lose weight, yes. but not anybody can maintain that weight loss. That is the difference. Weight loss is possible. Maintenance of that weight loss is so draining and that creates a lot of unhappiness. So for working towards happiness, like uh, wonderful speaker Iris has spoken about, maintenance of a weight is so important because the up and down creates bad health, poor health and unhappiness. Um, we are way over time. Someone of course is talking about the Mediterranean diet, which is a wonderful lifestyle intervention with tremendous amounts of plant food, as well as some protein sources. So, you know, that does lead. Um, it's interesting. I just came back from Lyon, France, where I think I saw some of the most delicious but unhealthy food possible. Um, <laughs> but it was a short excursion there, so you could tolerate it. And um, it's really um, wonderful. Um, it's an, it also has a nice scoring system to keep track with patients. Um, Hugo's mentioning about the Mediterranean diet. I can't thank all of you enough. I think you should be feel very proud that Northwell is taking this on as a topic under the leadership of Hugo Ortego in the Department of General Internal Medicine and with Bob Gluck at the School of Health Professions, Nursing PA, as well as medical school with our new Lifestyle Medicine Club. Um, that we have headed up. So if you have an interest in working in this area, I would definitely stay in touch with them. And of course, I would read Iris's book, which we already know is in our library and you can get on Kindle if you prefer. Alice, I would, can I just, can I, can I interrupt just to- Yes, go know, ahead. I, I, Iris is very, uh, she's being very humble. She's actually not a first time author. So actually she has uh, at least one other book out uh, I believe it's with her husband, who's an astrophysicist, I think, Living with the Stars, which I took a look at, which is also uh, tremendously interesting. So uh, I just throw that out. Um, I don't think she'd have time to mention it. So, And of course, as usual, we don't have time for everything. And I hope in, you know that this whets your appetite and you should continue to discuss these things back in your individual areas as well. And if anybody wants to get in touch through my email, I'm, I'm totally open to that. I'd, I'd welcome it. Okay, thank you very, very much. And um, everybody have a great day. And um, I'll see you next month. October 25th, we'll be doing a wonderful article with the first, you, author, the first you author of that article. Thank you. I'm really trying to bring the actual authors of things forward versus just discussing an article. It really gives an authentic approach to the journal clubs. So looking forward to these future journal clubs. Thank you. And I don't have Wendy here to remind me, but I'll stop the recording. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Iris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.